Miguel Cabrera is one of the most interesting characters in baseball history. A prodigy, a child at heart, and a man with demons turned out to be one of the most beloved players ever. We're going to dive deep into why he's an even better player than most remember, and much more than just one of the best hitters of all time. Born in Marique, Venezuela, Cabrera showed interest in baseball and volleyball early on. His mom, Gregoria Torres, played for the Venezuelan national softball team and numerous state teams. She also had three sisters that played softball and two brothers that played professional baseball. It's safe to say that hitting was in the family. She actually joked that she was the best hitter in the family until Cabrera reached 3,000 hits. Cabrera's uncle on his mom's side, David Torres, ran a baseball training program for kids. Ultimately, Torres was Cabrera's first coach and guide in the baseball world. At 14 years old, Cabrera enrolled in a baseball school where he continued his high school studies but had a heavy emphasis on baseball after the unfortunate passing of Torres. In 1999, at 16 years old he was signed by the Marlins. At the double-a level in 2003 Cabrera was hitting 365 with 10 homers and 59 RBIs in June. On June 20th of that year he was called up at the age of 20. Now Cabrera has three highlight homers that you've probably seen on repeat for years now. One of them happens tonight and two of them happen in this season. He started his first game off 0 for 4 with a strikeout and grounded into a double play. However with the game tied at 1 in the 11th he made history. His first ever hit was a walk-off home run, the third player since 1900 to ever do that. And it wasn't long until he became the cleanup hitter for the Marlins. And that's a team with Pudge Rodriguez, Derek Lee, and Mike Lowell all at the same time. He went on to win the NL Rookie of the Month in July and September. Marlins became the only wild card for the NL that year and played Barry Bonds Giants. After going 0 for 9 with 5 strikeouts and just one walk and an error to start, the Marlins still led the series. 2-1. However, in Game 4, Cabrera broke out with a 4-5 for five performance, a couple of doubles, three RBIs all coming with two outs, and his last hit came in the 8th and gave the Marlins the winning runs. This took them to the 2003 NLCS. In Game 1, Cabrera was 2-for-6 with his first postseason home run, and his team came away with a 9-8 victory in extra innings. In Games 2-5, through five, Cabrera went 6-for-13 with another home run, 5 runs scored, and a couple of walks. And while he didn't have a great performance in that infamous Game 6, Cabrera is a part of history. He reached on an error to the second Alex Gonzalez playing shortstop in that series, right after the whole Bartman thing happened and then Pudge doubled. And then Cabrera came around to score on a sack fly which ultimately was the winning run for the Marlins. And in Game 7, he put up another 1-for-5 performance. However, the only hit came in the first, and it was a 3-run homer. He also collected another RBI later on, and his team went on to win the game and the series. In just their second time in the postseason, the Marlins were headed to the World Series for the second time. And Cabrera had a pretty quiet series overall, just 4-for-19 with 3 RBIs, 7 strikeouts. But he did have one massive moment. In Game 4, Roger Clemens was starting for the Yankees. At 41 years old, he was still putting up some pretty good workhorse numbers. The first pitch of the AB came up and in, and you can see Cabrera give Clemens this glance like he is absolutely ready to kill. Swings through this fastball, still pretty worked up, and then swings over this breaking ball, probably still seeing red. However, this is where he locks in. He spits on the next breaking ball, fouls off two in a row before showing the world who he was. Into right field, back is Garcia, at the wall, home run Cabrera, 2-0 Florida. He took a Clemens fastball deep to the opposite field for a 2-0 lead in the first, and his team went on to win 4-2. That evened the series at two games apiece, and the Marlins did not lose again. An amazing and legendary start to an amazing career. 2004 was Cabrera's first full Major League season, and in 160 games, he led his team in slugging percentage, home runs, runs scored, and RBIs. It was his first All-Star appearance, however, the Marlins lost two World Series pieces, 
pudged a free agency and they traded away Derek Lee. After a 30-20 start, the Marlins couldn't stay consistent and finished just 83-79, third place in the NL East. In 2005, Cabrera continued to improve, leading his team in batting average, home runs, RBIs, and he finished second in the National League in total hits. He won his second All-Star appearance and his first Silver Slugger in left field. He became the youngest player ever with back-to-back 30-plus -back homer seasons at 22 years old and 143 days. And he became the only Marlin ever with back-to-back -back 100 RBI seasons. However, the Marlins went on to finish with the exact same record and finished third place again. In 2006, during the offseason, the Marlins decided to unload most of their World Series pieces. They traded away Josh Beckett and Mike Lowell for Hanley Ramirez and Anibal Sanchez. They traded away Carlos Delgado, Paul Loduca, and Juan Pierre. All told, it was 7.1 war traded away, and they received 0.9 war in return. Despite these moves and a painfully slow start, just 11-31 on May 21st, they made things interesting late with a 65-66 record on August 29th. Cabrera's greatness continued, improving his slash line all the way around, having an OPS plus nearly 60% better than the average hitter, not to mention hitting 50 doubles. He also moved to third base full time in this season and went to another all-star game, won another silver slugger, finished fifth in the MVP voting, and finished second for the NL batting crown on the final day of the season. And he continued to do things no one has ever seen. On June 22nd, in a game in Baltimore, the score was tied 5-5 with Hanley Ramirez at second base. The Orioles intelligently decided to intentionally walk Cabrera, or so Todd Williams thought. He left this one a little bit too close to the plate and Cabrera reached out and got it and drove in the game winning run. However, the team finished just 78 and 84 and dropped to fourth place. In 2007, the Marlins continued to plummet, finishing last in the NL East. The only bright spot for the Marlins that year was Cabrera. He put up great numbers again, hitting 320 and setting new career highs in home runs and RBIs. He made his fourth All Star game and became the third youngest player to. 500 RBIs. Only Mel Ott and Ted Williams did it younger. At this point, he was second in Marlins history for home runs, third in RBIs, and first for batting average. Then came the biggest life changer of his career. The Marlins decided to trade Cabrera with Dontrell Willis to the Tigers for Andrew Miller, Cameron Maben, and a few others. The Tigers quickly signed Cabrera to an eight-year, $152 million extension, the fourth largest contract at the time. He was now going to a Tigers team who had just been in the World Series in 2006 and barely missed the playoffs the year before. This is a team with players like Justin Verlander, Magli Ordonez, Curtis Granderson, not to mention he was being reunited with catcher Pudge Rodriguez. At this point, Cabrera felt like he had to do more, so he and his wife Rosenhell started the Miguel Cabrera Foundation, which was focused on renovating and enhancing youth ball Ballparks. They later joined forces with new teammate Magli Ordonez to provide scholarships to Detroiters, which eventually expanded to South Florida and even Venezuela. For these efforts, Cabrera was continually nominated for the Roberto Clemente Award for the Tigers. In his very first game, he hit a home run in his third at bat for his first hit as a Tiger. That season, he made the move over to first base because he's pretty bad defensively. But he went on to reach a thousand hits and led the AL in home runs and total bases that season and set a new career high in RBIs. In 2009, he somehow continued to improve. He went 4 for 6 with 6 RBIs in a grand slam on opening day, and he didn't slow down from there. He hit his 200th career home run, which made him 4th all-time for any Venezuelan-born player. And again, his entire slash line improved. Things seemed to be amazing and like they couldn't get any better. He was getting paid, he was getting better, and he was on a team that was trying to win. On October 2nd, Detroit was one game up on Minnesota with two days left in the season. The Tigers were trying to get back to the postseason for the first time since 06, and for Cabrera it would be the first time since 2003. However, early the next morning, police were called to the Cabrera household. According to police, the story goes that Cabrera came back home at 5 a.m. after a night of heavy drinking. His wife Rosenhell was upset that he was in this state in the first place. He was loud and woke up their child. The two had a quote, minor physical altercation with an undetermined aggressor, neither person press charges. However, Cabrera blew a 0.26. For reference, 0.08 is the legal limit in Michigan. 
News broke of this after the regular season ended and the Tigers and Twins tied for first place in the division. They were going to have to play a game 163 in Minnesota just four nights after this event. And it was the best game 163 ever. Cabrera doubled in the second inning and advanced to third but failed to score. In the third inning, Granderson walked, advanced to second, and Maglio drove him in with this base hit. Cabrera stepped up to the plate and knocked this two-run homer to dead center. Detroit led 3-0. However, Cabrera's next three at bats went like this. Ground out in the sixth, ground out in the eighth, and ground out in the 10th. Minnesota took the lead in the 7th with an Orlando Cabrera two-run homer, but Detroit tied it back up as Maglio went yard. Each team scored in the 11th to take this game to the 12th. In the 12th inning, Cabrera began the rally with a one-out walk, and he clearly wasn't happy about it. He would have rather hit. He went first to third on this Don Kelly base hit, which forced the Twins to intentionally walk Ryan Rayburn. It makes you wonder, if Cabrera hadn't taken the extra 90 feet, would they have pitched to Rayburn? With the bases loaded and one out, it was clear that the first pitch hit Brandon Inge's jersey, but he was not awarded the hit by pitch. He went on to hit into a fielder's choice, which prevented a run from scoring, and the Tigers failed to get anyone home in the 12th, and the Twins went on to walk it off in the bottom half. Cabrera was 90 feet away twice from continuing the season. Instead, he missed the playoffs again, and the Tigers became the first team in history to miss the playoffs with a three-game lead with four games to go. Before before the 2010 season, it was reported that Cabrera had spent three months during the offseason in an alcohol abuse treatment center and said he hadn't had a drink since the incident. Treatment was to continue into the regular season. On May 24th, Cabrera went on paternity leave for the birth of his second child, his daughter Isabella. He came back on May 28th and did something new. The first pitch he saw, he launched this opposite field two run homer, took the second pitch he saw, and rocked this third pitch for another home run. Then in his fourth at bat, he took two pitches and then caught a hanger for his third homer of the game. It was the first time he had done that in his career, and he was coming off the birth of his child. And Cabrera's torrid pace didn't slow down from there. He made his first AL All-Star team, and I'm gonna stop things right there. Look at this dude's numbers in 2008 and 9. Like, how did this guy not make the All-Star team both years? He competed in the Home Run Derby, led the AL in RBIs, on-base percentage, OPS+, and intentional walks. He set a new career high in home runs, slugging percentage, and OPS, and finished second in the MVP voting behind Josh Hamilton. Now, it's pretty debatable who was better overall, but the difference maker was the Rangers went to the World Series and the Tigers finished 500. Cabrera missed the playoffs seven years in a row now, and it was yet to make it in Detroit. He was likely frustrated with the team because his best was wasn't good enough to get them to where they wanted to be, his best wasn't good enough to win the MVP, and other problems started to arise. On February 16th, 2011, Cabrera was arrested and charged with a DUI. Now there's an infamous quote that comes out of this event that leaves out the second half of the quote, so I'll start with the second half first. You don't know anything about my problems. Clearly, he's dealing with some issues and not dealing with them very healthily. Now, the first half is, do you know who I am? I think with the context of the second half of this quote, it can be pretty reasonably assumed that he's talking about being a famous person, making a lot of money, and having a ton of pressure to perform well, and it's still not good enough. Granted, he's still dealing with these things very unhealthily and needed help. Clearly he had his demons, but he never had another reported issue with his drinking again after this point. In 2011, things started to change. The Tigers signed Victor Martinez and Joaquin Benoit, traded for Delman Young and Doug Fister, Justin Verlander won the Cy Young and MVP, and players like Max Scherzer, Alex Avila, and Austin Jackson all took huge steps up, taking a ton of pressure off of Cabrera. And he went on to win his first batting title while also leading the league in on-base percentage, doubles, and and games played. The Tigers ran away with the division for the first time since 1987, and it was their first ever AL Central title. In the ALDS versus the Yankees, Cabrera was pretty quiet, going 3 for 15, but the Yankees were very careful with how they pitched him, walking him five times. However, Cabrera was a big part of turning the tide of the series. After a blowout 9-3 loss in Game 1, he started Game 2 with a bang, a two-run shot in the first, and an RBI single in the sixth to give Detroit a 3-0 lead, who ultimately went on to win the game and the series in five games. Now the ALCS was a completely different story. Cabrera started slow in the first two road games, however in game three he had an RBI double in the fifth to give the Tigers their first lead of the series and they never looked back. He sealed the game in the seventh with this absolute 
moonshot to left. In Game 4, Cabrera was responsible for two-thirds of Detroit's offense, with a third-inning two-run double to break open the scoring. However, the Rangers were very careful with him from then on, walking him three times before they came away with a 7-3 victory. In Game 5, the Tigers had their backs against the wall. The game was tied 2-2 in the 6th, and the Rangers continued to pitch Cabrera carefully with two more walks. However, Cabrera broke through this time with an RBI double, and he scored on the rarest play in baseball, a Victor Martinez triple. The Tigers went on to win 7-5. Game 6, back in Texas, Cabrera homered in the first like he had a couple of times before. Even though the Tigers scored the first two runs, a 9-run third for the Rangers did him in. Cabrera came up for his last at bat, his team down 15-4, and still did all he could and hit another home run. In the series, this guy hit 400 with a slugging percentage over 1,000. Not OPS, slugging percentage. He hit three home runs, drove in seven, he even stole a base. He added 10.4% championship WPA. He had his best playoff series ever ever and it still wasn't good enough for the Tigers. More bad news struck in the offseason before 2012. Victor Martinez, who was so good that year in protecting Cabrera, went down with an injury working out in the gym. GM David Dombrowski quickly flipped around and signed the biggest free agent on the market, Prince Fielder, for nine years and 214 million. Now this directly impacted Miguel Cabrera because not only did he get more protection behind him, he also moved to third base willingly because Prince fielder was also a first baseman. The two clicked quickly, each hitting two home runs on April 7th, including back-to-backs in the fifth inning. It was a historic season for Cabrera. He reached a thousand RBIs and only these players did it faster. He had his 300th home run, which was the second most by a Venezuelan ever. And he was the first Tiger with five straight 30 home run seasons. He went on to make his seventh All-Star team. But the most legendary achievement from that season was the Triple Crown. He led the league in homers, RBIs, and batting average. It was the first time it had been done since Carl Yastrzemski in 1967. But here's where it gets crazier. He was the first non-outfielder to do it since Lou Gehrig in 1934. He was the first ever Latin American player and third baseman to win it. He also led the league in slugging percentage, OPS, and total bases, and went on to win the MVP even with the emergence of Mike Trout. Even though it came right down to the season's end, the Tigers did clinched their second straight AL Central title. In the ALDS against Oakland, Cabrera had a pretty rough series. His only RBI came on a bases loaded hit by pitch, but the rest of the team stepped up. Big names like Verlander and Scherzer, and even guys like Don Kelly helped carry the weight. It was clear that things were different. The ALCS was all Tigers from start to finish. Even though he had a good series, he didn't have to carry the team, driving in four with a home run, and that was enough for a four-game sweep. However, in the World Series, the whole team did not perform well against the Giants. In fact, the offense was shut out on two different occasions and scored just a total of six runs. Cabrera only had three hits, one coming in Game 1, and it was an RBI single with the team already down 6-1. to one. He got a single in Game 3, but he was immediately wiped out by a double play. But in Game 4, he had a two-run homer in the third to give Detroit their first and only lead of the series. However, Buster Posey launched a two-run shot of his own to give San Francisco the lead right back. Delman Young responded with a home run to tie the game back up, but in the 10th inning, Ryan Terrio and Marco Scudero singles scored one for the Giants. With two outs and the bases empty, Cabrera was caught looking on a fastball to lose the series. So close yet so far, the Tigers sought to improve to get over the hump in the offseason. They extended Anibal Sanchez and Justin Verlander, signed Brian Pena for an offensive boost to catcher, and signed Torrey Hunter, with Victor Martinez coming back to the lineup as well. And after shortstop Johnny Peralta got caught in the Biogenesis scandal, they quickly traded for Jose Iglesias for a replacement, and they also traded for bullpen help in Jose Veras. They were primed for a World Series run. And through the first 41 games, Cabrera was electric. He was hitting nearly 400 with 8 homers and 42 RBIs. But on May 19th, the world knew that this was more than just another good season. In his first at bat against the Rangers, he singled after 7 pitches. On the first pitch he saw in his second at bat, he launched a 3-run homer. And then in his third at bat, he hit an 8-pitch home run. 
Rangers intelligently, intentionally walked him in the fourth, and then in the fifth, down one and two in the count, Cabrera homered to dead center. It was the second three homer game of his career, and he went four for four with three home runs, five RBIs, and four runs scored in the game. And he didn't slow down from there. At the All-Star break, he was the first player ever with 30 or more home runs and 90 or more RBIs. His average was as high as 360 on August 26th. That's like if Luis Arise hit 40 home runs in a year. However, in late July, early August, a groin injury popped up for Cabrera and slowed him down tremendously. On July 22nd, he was on pace for 52 homers and 160 RBIs. This would have been one of the best seasons we would have ever seen from a hitter not named Bonds. After the injury, he was on pace for a season that looked a lot more like his final totals. He played through immense pain this season, and it was never more apparent than playing the Yankees in New York. In the top of the ninth, with the Tigers down 3-1, to one, with two outs and a runner on, Miguel Cabrera came to the dish against Mariano Rivera, the best hitter in baseball versus the best closer in history. The first pitch was a foul pop-up that was nearly caught. History would have been absolutely changed if this wasn't out. Thank you, Lyle Overbay. Next pitch was a foul to the left side, and he quickly fell behind 0-2. After a ball up, he fouled this one right off his knee. You can see him limping around, and even the manager and head trainer had to come out and look at him. He limped back into the box and then immediately fouled off another pitch, this time off the inside of the shin. I think Torrey Hunter's face says it all. He got the tiniest bit of a breather with this ball missing out, but then Mariano made a mistake. High fly ball, center field. Gardner going back, still going back. Track, wow! An absolutely legendary at bat, but you've probably seen this highlight hundreds of times. But here's what most people don't know. Two days later, with the Tigers down 4-2 in the ninth, Miggy let off the ninth against Mariano. He quickly fell behind 1-2, and two, but after watching a ball out, Mariano made yet another mistake. Fly ball, right field, hit well, way back, that ball is up, and he's done it again! Incredible. Miguel Cabrera is just absolutely unbelievable. Incredible. These ended up being the only two hits Cabrera had off of Mariano in his career. However, he was two for six, and tied first all time for home runs off of Mariano Rivera. And everyone else who had two home runs had three times or more plate appearances. And for good measure, Victor Martinez also took him deep to tie the game. He finished that year winning his third straight batting title. It was the first Tiger to do it since Ty Cobb, and the first righty since Rogers Hornsby. Cabrera finished second in home runs and RBIs that season, only to Chris Davis. Now, if Chris Davis had this insane season, even a year later, Miguel Cabrera would have won the Triple Crown two years in a row. However, he did win the Sabermetric Triple Crown, leading the league in batting average, on base percentage, and slugging percentage with a 190 OPS+. Plus. This guy was 90% better than the average player. This was a better year than his Triple Crown year. He won his second MVP in a row, and it was the third in a row for the Tigers. He was the third Tiger ever to win two or more MVPs, and it was the first time since Frank Thomas that a player won two MVPs in a row. Cabrera even made the MLB The Show 14 cover for this. The Tigers won the division for the third year in a row with an injured Miggy, but it was the best team yet. This ALDS was back in Oakland, and Cabrera in Game 1 had an RBI single in the first, and after two more runs scored for the Tigers, they went on to win 3-2. In Game 2, the Tigers got only a total of four hits, one coming from Cabrera, but they lost on a walk-off to Cleveland's new manager. In Game 3, the Brandon Moss and Seth Smith homer were too much to overcome for the Tigers, who fell down two games to one. In Game 4, the Tigers' bats exploded for eight runs on nine hits to tie the series. In Game 5, Verlander turned in an amazing performance, 8 innings pitched with 10 strikeouts and no runs scored. 
After a Tory Hunter single in the fourth, an injured Cabrera took maybe a 75% strength swing and launched a two run homer, which ultimately won the game and the series for the Tigers. The ALCS started in Boston. Game one was a pitcher's duel. Cabrera walked, Fielder was hit by a pitch, and Victor Martinez reached on a fielder's choice, which led to a Johnny Peralta, yeah, he's back now, RBI single. Cabrera came in to score the game's only run. And game two started great for the Tigers. After one in the first, Cabrera homered in the sixth, followed by three more runs to make it five to nothing. However, their biggest weakness reared its ugly head: the bullpen. I can't watch. Oh god, no! Oh god, no! 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 The series and the team felt different after this moment. Game 3 was the reverse of Game 1. This time, Mike Napoli hit a solo home run for the only run of the game. In Game 4, the Tigers fought back with a 5-run second topped off by a Miggy RBI single, and he got another one in the 4th to get them the win. In Game 5, down 4 to nothing after 3, Cabrera knocked in Jackson with 2 outs. The Tigers got one more back in the 6th before Cabrera came back up in the 7th. He had runners at the corners with nobody out, but he could only only muster a double play ball. However, a run did come in to make it a one run game, but that ended up being the final score. In game six, down one to nothing in the sixth, Torrey Hunter walked, followed by a Cabrera base hit, and then a fielder walk loaded the bases before Victor Martinez drove in two with an RBI single. Cabrera came in to score the second run, and unfortunately, that was the last run for the Tigers as they lost five to two and lost the series. There's a lot of debate to be had about the best teams to never make the World Series, but the 2013 Tigers is definitely in the conversation. But Cabrera only had two years left on his contract. The Tigers kept losing, and their window was closing. Things were getting desperate. Could the Tigers and Cabrera finally get over the hump? 